when you're designing style frames for something, like you're creating like a world that this spot or whatever is going to live in, you know, and sound design is another like world building tool. And so I think the worlds that you get to make in animation are just more interesting than ones that are grounded more in reality. Hey Hatchlings, welcome to the Motion Hatch podcast. I'm your host, Haley Akins. On this week's podcast, we have Wesley Silver of Sono Sanctus. Sono Sanctus is his sound design studio, and he also composes music for really big animation companies like Oddfellows and Giant Ant, you know, who we all love. And it was really great to talk to him. He talked a lot about how he built a team because he wanted to find different people with different strengths and then how that can lead to bigger projects. It was really, really insightful. I thought it was awesome to get a sound designer on to kind of talk about the other side of making animations and, you know, how much sound makes animation great and things like that. It was super, super interesting. I really hope you enjoy the episode. Hi, Wes. Thanks so much for coming on the podcast. Hey, my pleasure. So you seem quite integrated into the motion design community. How did you first get involved doing sound design for animations? Yeah, so, you know, for a lot of my career, I didn't know what motion graphics was. I didn't realize like how much content was getting made. Um, So originally I went to school because I wanted to make records. And then I realized that you can't make a living recording bands anymore. (laughs) Um, (laughs) And then from there, I just... I wanted to get more into video game sound design and just kind of got through in, interested in a lot of different aspects of how sound recording is is used. So I worked on so like science fiction B movies and made my own music and that kind of stuff. And then a friend introduced me to a guy named Jordan Scott, who is pretty well known, I'd say, in the in the motion graphics community. Yeah. And he needed some sound design for a promo for his wife's blog and uh, sent that to me and I worked on the sound for that. And I was like, oh, this is really fun. And realized that, you know, motion graphics and animation is really this sort of blank canvas for sound because it's literally silent. But also there's no real expectation of what anything should sound like since it's not real. So I had a lot of fun with that. And through that video, it started getting more likes on Vimeo. And I was like, oh, Vimeo, this is cool. There's all these different people that make animations who watch each other's stuff and comment on it and and like it and all that. So from there, I just started following up with people who commented on the sound or who liked the video and then offered to just work on their like test animations and little personal projects and stuff. Because, you know, I had a, had a, quite a bit of experience with recording and some experience making music at that time, but I hadn't really had experience doing sound design for motion graphics and became a really good opportunity to practice that. And from there, I just kept doing that. And I, I think got a lot more um, involved in the community that way because I was really trying to serve that community and trying to like get a better sense for how do we use sound with animation. Yeah, so like, you know, having that first contact as Jordan, that, that's pretty awesome Like, because his things get viewed quite a lot. So I imagine that gave you quite a good start. Yeah, I was really lucky. <laughs> And, and Jordan, too, is someone who, and I think there's a, this is what I love about being involved in motion graphics, is that he's somebody, like a lot of people, uh, who are really focused on the community and really want to meet other motion designers and want to introduce people. I mean, I think your your podcast is a testament to that, too. Like, oh, you know, I realize, oh, there's people doing the work out there, but there's also, there's so much, like, encouragement and so much collaboration. And, you know, it really is like a community. Yeah, definitely. I would say that. I think, you know, it's definitely cool to just be able to reach out to people. And most people, even if you think they're like design superstars or whatever, they're they're usually quite responsive and like, oh yeah, sure. Like about stuff, if they can be, you know, if they have time and things like that. I mean, obviously don't go and bombard everybody, but you know, (laughs) like... I think uh, in general, I think people are quite happy to kind of speak to people. And I noticed on Twitter, I think, uh, I think obviously Instagram as well, but Twitter is quite a big place where everyone seems to be gathered. And that's kind of how I've made quite a lot of connections in the motion design industry is through using Twitter a lot and just following absolutely loads of studios and animators and just 
kind of saying hello to them and retweeting their stuff and then people start retweeting your stuff and things like that. Do you think that's kind of what most people do? Do you think that's quite helpful? Yeah, absolutely. I would say like early in my career, you know, when I was trying to, you know, get more work or meet more people, find more things to work on. I was on yeah. Vimeo a ton and on Twitter a little bit. I'd say now I'm on Twitter way more um, than on Vimeo just because I don't have as much time to watch things. But Twitter is really a great place for conversation, I think. So you started off doing, you wanted to do music stuff because you wanted to be like a producer for bands or something like that? Yeah, that's that's exactly it. I wanted to be Phil Eck, basically, and make the next Modest Mouse record. <laughs> <laughs> Um, nice. But yeah, I realized pretty quickly, that was about 2005. And so it was like really as the record industry was changing a lot and, you know, basically tanking. Yeah, that, it's really funny because I started doing film production and music technology. And then because I wanted to just be in bands. So I thought, oh, I'll do music tech because then I'll be in a band. And then I was like, this is not what this is about at all. Yeah. <laughs> so it could have been in the same situation as you, but then I just dropped the music tech part and pursued the film and then ended up getting into animation that way. So it always makes me laugh when I meet people and they're like, yeah, because I wanted to be in a band or I wanted to do music. And then everyone goes, oh, no one can make any money from music. Okay, we'll do this other creative thing that's just as cool. Like, Well, for me, I, always, I thought, oh, I don't want to try to make it as a musician. Oh, I can be an audio engineer producer and then realize that like that's probably even harder <laughs> harder yeah, to make a living exactly. at. Yeah, yeah, it's quite funny. It felt like a real job though. Like it feels like, you know, you're like editing and like it feels like that's like actual work. <laughs> yeah, it just makes me laugh cuz like every I think I saw on Twitter the other day everyone was like, "I used to be in a metal band." Yeah, I was in a metal band too and then it's like just everyone going off on a tangent about what bands they used to be in and then they became animators. It just makes me laugh. Yeah, I, I was on that thread, but let's not let's not pry into that anymore because I admitted how uh, it was in a terrible pop punk band in high school. So Oh right, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah we're not gonna not dig go up any it. of that and play it on your show. This isn't <laughs> gonna be like an expose. I, I my career can't handle that. See, because yeah, <laughs> you, you get it doesn't matter how bad your band was if you're a motion designer. It's not as good when you're a composer though. Oh <laughs> uh, right, yeah, yeah. This is true. Okay, okay. Sorry, sorry. No, I'm, sorry. I'm just I was kidding, just trying to dig in. It's pretty I was embarrassing. Trying to dig stuff. in. <laughs> cool. So you've got some like really good clients now, really great studios like Giant Ant and Odd Fellows. You know, how did you end up getting in touch with them? So Giant Ant, like I guess specifically, Giant Ant reached out to me about a project we did for uh, Mailchimp recently with Oddfellows. That goes back to Jordan, actually, really the first motion designer that I met. Oh, yeah, yeah. So yeah, he was freelancing with Oddfellows at the time that we met. And then, um, yeah, we think we had breakfast at F5 a few years ago. Okay, yeah. I remember how long ago that was. But yeah, was, uh, so I actually got to meet Chris and Colin at a at a conference. And then from there, we did some work together. Okay, cool. Yeah, that's good. So do most of your clients now, they just kind of reach out to you because obviously you've done a lot of motion design work. So I imagine a lot of sound designers don't dig into niches that much, if that makes sense. Like as in like, you're kind of like a sound designer, but your niche is like motion design. That's how I feel about it. I don't know whether that's how you feel about it. but yeah, no, that is, That's definitely how I feel about it. Yeah, I'd say like just kind of in general the way that I, I find myself working with new clients is either, you know, somebody that I work with is freelancing somewhere or goes to work somewhere else. And so they introduce me um, or someone just sees the work that I've done and reaches out because they need something that's kind of similar or whatever. But yeah, I, I would actually, I, I think that sound designers really do fall into niches because, you know, there's video game sound designers and Hollywood film sound designers and, commercial sound designers. I mean, I think that's like more broadly what I do. So much of the more interesting work in commercial sound design is in motion graphics because the projects just sort of call for bigger sound design usually than like live action or documentary style stuff. It's like you said, like you can basically do whatever you want with it to a certain extent because it's a blank canvas in terms of sound. Yeah, and I think a lot of times people want you to do something that's more interesting with it. Yeah. 
because it it's surreal because it's not realistic. Yeah, yeah, that's true. I think that when you're designing style frames for something, like you're creating like a world that this spot or whatever is going to live in, you know, and sound design is another like world building tool. And so I think yeah. the worlds that you get to make in animation are just more interesting than ones that are grounded more in reality. Yeah, definitely. No, that's what I think. That's why I wanted to do animation and motion design rather than be like a film editor or, or you know, like a TV editor or whatever. Because I feel like you have more control over what you make and you can make like a crazy fantasy world or something like that, like much easier. Whereas if you're just the editor on a show, then you're not obviously going to be usually doing the filming and all the camera stuff and the editing. But like if you're a motion designer, you're usually designing everything, like the whole world and all the characters and everything and then animating it all. So you can kind of let your imagination run wild more, if that makes sense. Yeah, That's what absolutely. I think. Yeah, and then obviously sound design. Like what I want to say about that, most importantly, is every time I do an animation, I'm like, yeah, this is okay. You know, this is quite cool. And then like I send it off to get some sound design done on it or like, you know, get some music or whatever. And then they send it back to me and then I'm like, oh my God, it's like so much better. <laughs> like it just yeah. makes it like 100%. <laughs> in my eyes, I'm always like, it's so much cooler now. Like it has a little sound when that bit comes out and then it just like, I guess it kind of accentuates like the moves more and things like that. So it makes you think it's, and also because you're normally so close to a project that I feel like I don't have any like space to view it. And then when it has sound on, for some reason that creates like a bit of space in my head or something. So then I can kind of see it more objectively again. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Yeah, and I mean, you know, really, if we go back to you know, describing it as world building, it's like you, you've animated it, but you don't have that other really important sense of the world until you you put sound to it. It really is like completing the work that you've put in as an animator. Yeah, definitely, I agree with that. So, do you think that you know motion designers could kind of do what you do in a way, and like could try and find a niche within that? Like, I know I've heard people talking about being kind of motion designers in like a scientific kind of space or something like that. I was trying to think about it today, like how could people kind of make themselves the person to go to in motion design for something in particular? Yeah, I mean, I guess, you know, if we look at that with sound, it's like I didn't set out to be a motion graphics sound designer. I set out to make stuff. And what I do is I do sound and music. <laughs> and then the opportunity that presented itself was motion graphics. And I realized, oh, I really like that. And so I, I kept running with it. But, you know, I, I guess most of my work probably is motion graphics, but I do a lot of live action and, and video games and other things as well. So it's definitely not all that I do. I guess part of it is like if you're good at something and it, opportunities present themselves or you're able to sort of create more of those opportunities for yourself, like, that seems like kind of the the way to, to do it, you know? The way that I've approached my work is really like early on was chase every opportunity I could get because that was like how I could make a living and how I could find what's going to stick. And now I'm having to choose a little bit more, but it's still kind of following that same mentality. It's just following every opportunity that's like a worthwhile opportunity, you know, that are things that I feel like are worth working on. Um, and that still falls into a lot of motion graphics work in that niche. You know, there's there's a lot of other there's other work that it's kind of like ah, I'm just either not trying to pursue it as much, or you know, maybe I just bid a little bit higher on something because it's more difficult. It doesn't come as naturally to me. So like, maybe I could do this sound design for a motion graphics piece quite a bit cheaper than like a live fully for a short film, just because I've have so much more practice at it. So you know, my, my bid comes in higher because I'm slower at it and then I don't get the job, but it's sort of like focuses me more on the work that I, I'm enjoying and that I'm getting better at and more uh, specialized at. Yeah, I just wondered like whether you thought it could be more purposeful, you know, or whether, like you say, maybe it's just kind of what you start working on and then you kind of go deeper into that rabbit hole. 
Yeah, I, I guess I think it's probably just, it's sort of like a balance. I don't know, maybe there, there's some people that are better suited to specialization and there's, I, I consider myself actually like really more of a generalist, even though I do a lot of sound design for motion graphics. Like I'll do music that's really abstract ambient music and I'll do really peppy, you know, googly music or I'll do, you know, <laughs> kind of depending on, yeah. on what people need. And then I, I found, so with, with my company, Sonos Sanctus, um, I've, got a handful of contractors that I work with. And I've really loved that where I can now bring in people who are more specialized than me. And so on our, our core team, like we kind of have different strengths, uh, but then I'll also bring in, like if I'm doing a really heavy orchestral piece, I might bring in a colleague who does a lot of video game music. He just did some cues for the new Call of Duty game. And like he does, you know, epic orchestral cinematic, you know, music. Yeah. Where... I like dabbling in it, but it's just I know that I'm not going to be able to compete in that realm. Yeah, that's really interesting because it makes sense to me because music is so like, it can be so diverse. So I thought, oh, it's really impressive. Like if Wes is just like churning out all this stuff on your own, you know, but then it makes sense to me that you'd have kind of, oh, he's more a guy who likes to do this. She's like a girl who likes doing this kind of music. Like you come and do this for me and then give it to your client kind of thing that now in my head, I'm like, oh, right. Yeah, that makes total sense that you would do that. Yeah. And to, to me, it's it's like more satisfying to do that. And I feel like I learn a lot. Like I really like working on a project that is maybe not as much in my wheelhouse and then bringing somebody in to help with it who it's like very much their wheelhouse because I can yeah. just ask them questions along the way and I can still, you know, I'm still directing or I'm still like working on it, involved with it. but. It's, you know, it's a great experience, a great way to learn. Yeah, that's interesting. Do you think you have to charge more then because you're like kind of hiring other people than maybe what you used to? I'd say yes and no. I guess the thing is usually when I bring in other people, it's because the scale of the work is just bigger. Right, yeah. Um, and I would just need to charge more anyway, if that makes sense. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of projects where, so I, I work a lot with Ambrose Yu. He's, he's another sound designer and composer. We work together most days, actually. It's great and we've gotten a really good rapport where we will like the giant ant piece that you mentioned or yeah. um, MailChimp we worked on that together and it actually it made the project more efficient I think because I could compose sort of okay here's sort of like you know we talk about it we go okay this is sort of the tempo and this is what you know base very very big picture what we need to do I can like lay down some of the basic ideas get it started quickly send it back to him he can put some pieces on it then we send it to our mixer who can like kind of come at it with fresh ears and like clean it up and organize this piece that was like super dense and and complicated. And I'd say for that, it's like we really didn't have to charge more because we actually were more efficient working as a team because we could do things that we could work on quickly and then pass it on, you know. And then having those other perspectives too, I feel like is super helpful in getting it right early rather than, you know, working on something that you're just too close to and not realizing that you're making some mistakes or you know, whatever it is that are going to mean you have to go back and fix something or, or start over. Yeah, that totally makes sense. And I think the more that I've spoken to people about this, it's kind of like, you know, you work in a team, but then you're faster. So then it ends up, it costs the client the same amount, but then maybe you're getting more out of it because you get to work with someone else that you respect as well. And maybe at the end, you kind of, it's like a better project, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. And but I would say like for if a project has a really tight budget, it makes more sense to just go like okay, one person is going to crank this whole thing out and like yeah. minimize all the conversations and direction and and all of that stuff and just like if we're talking like maximum efficiency, I think you know, one man band kind of a thing works well for us, but yeah, when the once the scale gets a little bigger, I I don't think it really makes the project any more expensive. And I think it adds a ton of value because like on that, uh, I was keep using that MailChimp piece as an example on that. We had a lot of live instruments because Ambrose plays guitar and violin. I played trumpet on it. I played live bass on it. Um, you know, we were able to bring in a lot of instruments, but it was very still very quick and efficient because we're both already working on the project. Yeah. Uh, where that would have gotten pretty expensive and hard to deal with if we had to like hire out a trumpet player and hire out a violinist and hire out a guitarist. That that's where it, the scope of it would really get a lot more expensive. 
Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, so you're kind of using like your own skills that both of you have to bring it all together, really. Yeah, absolutely. So I just wondered, did you kind of purposefully brand yourself as Sono Sanctus rather than just like Wesley Slover? Yeah, I, I wanted to try to set up as a company early on so that it would be natural when I wanted to work with more people. It's only really been since like last spring that I've been regularly collaborating with contractors. Before that, it's like I would occasionally bring someone in to maybe play like guitar or you know, record some some string parts or something. But yeah, so I, I wanted to be in a position where it's like, even though it was just me, like that it's not weird if there's other people working on it or if I don't, you know, do everything that is is part of the project. Yeah, because I think a lot of animators have this question about, you know, should we be branding ourselves as like Haley Aiken's freelance designer, whatever, or like something else, you know, more of like a studio, I guess. But really you're like your sort of one man band studio until you want to hire in other people and other freelancers. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And the way I've thought about it is it's really like, what Sono Sanctus is, is it's me and it's a network of specialists. And, yeah, you know, in my mind, that's a lot better than just hiring me. You know, because part of hiring me is having access to other talent as well. And I think either makes sense. But we were talking about before the show that, you know, you like the business side of this. That's why you're doing the podcast, right? Like, I, I like yeah. business as well. Like, not, I don't want to be doing my own accounting and I don't want to be doing, you know, too much of the business side, but I love the idea of like, Hey, we've got a team and like, we have a company culture and like we work together and we learn from each other and we make stuff together. That's just more interesting than what, you know, I'd make by myself. And we send way too much Giphy on Slack, you know, <laughs> like that. Yeah, that to yeah, me, definitely. It, like, it's, it, I'm like excited about it. You know, I, I've been doing the, this, my company for a little over five years and like working with younger sound designers, for instance, is really satisfying like to go try to teach like these tricks and kind of expand the toolkit and have to develop the skill of listening critically to his work and giving him really clear helpful feedback you know those are skills that I really didn't have and I'm still working at a lot but to me that is like really satisfying and really really fun so I think that's part of why it made sense for me to try to build a company but I think it also makes complete sense that like, you know, if you're someone who wants to go work on somebody's project or you want to like kind of handle most things on your own, like, you know, billing yourself as, as yourself, I think is a, is a great direction for that as well. Yeah, I just wonder because if you start sort of saying you're a company, do you think that makes other companies view you differently or treat you differently? That's kind of the biggest question I have around this kind of thing. Cause I'm always like, yeah, it'd be super cool to like do like kind of more of a studio setup, but then are you going to run into problems because people, you know, they like the kind of working with people and their personalities. So I don't know. I mean, obviously most of your clients probably know you by now, but if you were just starting out, do you see what I mean? How I feel like that could maybe be a little bit of a problem. Yeah, that's something that we've been thinking about because I've kind of thought, oh man, it'd be great to have a project manager or whatever. And then through that thinking, okay, like what, how does this change the dynamic of how we work with clients? Because right now it's, I, I really like the spot that we're in now because essentially the company is me and a junior sound designer who's on full time uh, en slash engineer and then another contractor who's working like on specific projects. And so it's it's still like we're like a company, but we're also very personal with how we, you know, communicate like we're talking very directly with our clients and that kind of a thing. But yeah, I don't, I don't, you know, I don't know how it would really change. Um, I like to be like pretty upfront about things and like really structuring it as like a we, but also just having a really like personal touch as well. Because I think there's I, I would lose a lot of satisfaction of like if we had too many, you know, business manager type people and I didn't actually talk to the people I was working with and, you know, being more detached, I think I'd have a hard time with that and be kind of disappointed and feel like I was kind of missing something. Yeah. 
I don't know if that really gets at your question, though. <laughs> yeah, I just mean like, because you've kind of always kind of gone under that name, sort yeah. of. Yeah. So you kind of maybe, do you know, I'm thinking of it a point of view as like, if you're already a freelancer, like a sound designer or a motion designer or whatever, and you're just, you use your own name, like I do at the moment, but then kind of work with other freelancers, then is it beneficial to be called something else? Or does that make your clients view you differently? And is that negative or positive? Because I think a lot of people are sort of thinking this now more and more, especially people who maybe are a little bit more established as freelancers themselves. It's like, how do you grow, but you don't kind of lose that connection with your client and kind of your, what's the word, like your kind of reputation with them or whatever. Yeah. That makes sense. And maybe this goes back to, to what you were saying earlier, but like, I feel like with clients that you're already have like a relationship with, they're probably, I would think, feel, you know, if you're expanding to become like a billing yourself as a studio, it's like, oh, cool. This freelancer I'm working with or, or whatever is like successful. And so I'm working with somebody who's successful and they're, you know, their company's growing, but it's cool because I still, we're still like, have the same relationship that you had before. I guess to me, it's it's really just more about like what makes somebody feel good about the work they're doing and about their relationships with their clients and stuff. One thing that's nice, if you are like a freelancer and then you want to bring in a team of people, calling yourself like a studio is helpful in the sense that that person doesn't expect that you're doing everything yourself. Maybe this is different in yeah. animation, but like, with sound design, you know, a lot of times it's just one person doing all of it. And so I I wanted to be really clear as I started working more with contractors of like, hey, we are a team, we're working on this, but here's why that's a good thing. So that it's not like someone feels gypped of like, oh, so you're billing me your rate, but you're just hiring some kid out of college who, you know, to like do the work. It's like, no, 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 that's not what's going on, you know, and try to get them excited about the team dynamic and the people that I have working with me. Yeah, that makes sense. Like, yeah, when you say it like that, it's like, oh, right, yeah, because you're, I think that's right. Like, you have to be honest with your clients and you have to kind of explain the reasons why you're doing that, if that makes sense. Yeah, Yeah, because it's like you're kind of selling it as that and you're saying, you know, you're going to get more out of it because we're bringing different things to the table. Yeah. Like each of us in the team say, Rather than like, if you're going to hire one freelancer, I see people asking these questions all the time and I'm like, oh, like there's all kind of like loads of different little things, but it would probably help you get bigger direct to client jobs. But then sometimes maybe you would lose out on the smaller jobs if they're viewing you more of a studio and they don't know you, if that makes sense. Yeah, I I think though for me, like, to be honest, like I'm, I'm happy to do smaller jobs, but to be honest, they're just like let become less and less worth it when you consider how much yeah. work it takes to start and finish a project that's only billing for like six hours of work or something like that. There is like a part of what we're doing of like we want to do projects that are a little bit more substantial than that, just because it gets kind of crazy. Like with sound, it's it's different than animation because you know if someone spends two weeks on something, I spend like maybe a day on it. And so we have to juggle a ton of projects just to like keep things moving. Like I've had days where I've worked on six projects in the same day just because, oh, these, you know, this thing needs a round of revisions and there's this little project that's going on and, you know, kind of whatever it is. Yeah, it totally makes sense because it's like, you know, there's more like it's lots of little things rather than if you're like a sole animator by yourself then you're going to be just working on something solidly for like two to four weeks or something, say. Whereas that same project, you would probably only be doing sound design for like a couple of days or something like that, I imagine. Oh yeah, like usually, I would say usually like a day. Yeah, so. So I think the dynamic is a little different there, but that is part of like, you know, we're happy to do smaller projects, but like there's a cost in management there, kind of either way. But yeah, that's one of the advantages of having more of a fluid team, you know, available is that like we can manage a lot more easily than it was when it was just me. 
Yeah. You know, if something comes in with, a, if a client has a last minute request, it's a lot easier with three of us to go, hey, can anybody do this? <laughs> then, you know, when I was like, okay, I'll do this as soon as I can. So that's extra value that we're adding, I think, by being a little bit bigger. Yeah, that's true. So if an animator or motion designer or a studio, an animation studio, like say they're going to budget for an animation job, do you think that it's better to kind of get in touch with sound designers early or when do you think is ideal to kind of bring someone like you onto the project, if that makes sense? Yeah, I mean, I think the best is when they're bidding on the job to reach out to their sound designer about it. Because, you know, it's it's the kind of thing that depending on the how complicated the animation is, the sound design quote could be really different, right? It's it, it's the age old question of oh, how long does how much does a minute of animation cost? <laughs> and you yeah, go well, yeah, exactly. <laughs> kind of depends. Um, but so that's great. Early on, I'm always happy to quote, even if the project isn't happening yet or might not happen. You know, the way that I like to work as far as like when and things happen in the process is I like to start on music when their style frames or when their style frames and storyboards. Because usually from that point, you can get a sense for, okay, what is the tone of this? What's the world we're building? What what are you trying to communicate? How do I create music that supports that? And you know, once you have the storyboards, you kind of know, okay, we need this type of an arc. We need like a problem, then solution, or, or something like that. Where it's enough that you can demo out the piece early while animation is happening, and there's plenty of time that way makes for a nice relaxed you know feedback and and all of that. And then with sound design, I like to start sound design once there's maybe like 15 seconds of completed animation. Yeah. And I'll do a demo section of sound design in the same way that you might make style frames for a client. Yeah. So that we can focus on that and we can make sure that you really like it that your client really likes it. And when we're doing revisions, then we can just focus on the small piece of it rather than focusing on like a minute or two minutes of sound design. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, I think that to me, that is so much better than, hey, it's picture locked. Do you have a day? Finish it. Right. Yeah. <laughs> because, you know, I can do the piece in a day, but that doesn't really give us time to talk about it. It doesn't give us time to try things out in a really like small, manageable, controlled portion, you know? Yeah, that makes more sense because then you can kind of maybe the sound kind of adds more into the creative. So, you know, you could give the music a bit earlier to the animators and they can kind of, I feel like when you have music in mind already, it helps you animate. And especially if there's like a little team of animators to know kind of what the pace of the music is going to be and things like that. It can really make a big difference, the animation, I think. Definitely. And and I think having music direction early is really helpful because then you can start show you can show clients, you know, work in progress with some music to it that's not a temp yeah. track. Temp tracks are so tough to deal with because, you know, if a if a client really like falls in love with whatever temp track was put in there, it's really hard to shake them from that, you know? It's, you know, you get you get comfortable and familiar with something. And it's the worst when it's something like, oh, let's just put this Radiohead song in here. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> and then you got to go, well, shoot. <laughs> I can't make compete with Radiohead. <laughs> yeah. And I guess I'll, I'd add to, like, you know, for the first round, once I see style frames, or e maybe even before, I'll pitch from my library. I have, like, maybe 350 tracks or something in my library. Yeah. And I'll just pull a, a playlist of stuff and go, hey, does any of this, like, resonate with your vision for the project? And that ends up being super helpful because you can use it for temp music if you want to to get the client's feedback from it. But then we can either straight up license it, customize it, or you know, pretty closely draw inspiration from it without ripping off, you know, another artist. And then if it's from my library, that's all in my wheelhouse. So it's not like we're gonna end up with like, oh yeah, we want to go bluegrass. And I go, well, okay, we can do bluegrass, but like that's not really my thing. I'm not, you know a bluegrass musician. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, yeah, that makes sense. And I think it's really cool that you have like a library of music and stuff already because people can very easily go there and see like, oh yeah, so he does this kind of stuff and 
maybe we could just use that track or, you know, you can either make your life easier or you can kind of work on a new piece, which is, you know, do you feel like you get a bit sad if people are like, oh, I'll just take this library one then actually, or you, would you rather be working on a new piece of music every time? What do you think's better? I, uh, I, I love it when people license from my library. I mean, for one, it's like, feels like free money. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Cause it's like, you know, oh, I don't have to do any work. Cool. Here, here you go. You know, I mean, that, that's pretty great. The other part of that is that some of the more satisfying work lately has been projects that I've done specifically for library tracks. So, for instance, I work with a company called Marmoset, and they're a licensing house. Oh, yeah. Uh, they're fantastic. I, their catalog is great, and they're really great to work with. So I'll give them a shout out. So I'll do projects of like EPs, basically, with the intention of licensing, but they're, they're projects that are really more just like creative. And so in my mind, it's something between client work and personal projects. Um, and I, I really love doing that stuff. And so I think what I've been trying to do with library things is make the music that I want people to hire me to make. So a lot of times if someone licenses something from my library, it's something that I feel a little more passionate about and maybe something that would have been harder to sell a client on if I was like demoing out, we were going through the original music process compared to when I have this freedom to just kind of like, yeah, it's okay to take some liberties and and try things and not overthink some things. Yeah, that makes sense. So your library is like your show reel in a way. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it definitely is. Um, I mean, there's a project I'm working on right now that is really like, I'd like to do more scores for like documentary style pieces. And that's what this, the album is meant to either show like, hey, I, we can do stuff like this. Or yeah, this is like ready to go for your film. Um, like on that one, we're doing lots of versions of the tracks. So you've got cut downs, you've got really mellow ambient versions of it, kind of versions that are a little in between. I basically tried to like working on tracks and thinking through Okay, if if I was working with a client on this, what might they say? They might say, "Give it a big inspirational build and lift at the end." But they might also say, "Ah, yeah, don't do that really over the top build." And then trying to build out both yeah. of those versions ahead of time. Okay, yeah, that's interesting. You know what? I, I guess I should add to that. You know, given like your audience and stuff, is that you know, a lot of people go, "Oh, you probably always want you know original music for things and and whatnot." Honestly, I think that with a lot of composers are going to be hate me for saying this, but I think for a lot of more like explainer style animations, licensing actually works really well because if there's not like a really specific arc that you need to hit or like story moments that you need to hit, if you just need something that sort of starts and ends, um, licensing is great for that because you can get the client bought off on it early your client knows what they're getting. You don't have to worry about them going, oh, this isn't really what we thought it was going to be. You don't have to worry about like educating them on like, okay, no, this is going to change in these ways, you know, whatever it is. So I, I would say encourage people to say, hey, original music is great, but also, you know, licensing something out if it doesn't have to be really customized actually is, is not a bad idea. But license from good libraries and you're going to spend a lot less time digging for something. <laughs> yeah, that's, definitely my experience because sometimes I'm like looking around I'm like oh there's nothing in here everything is really bad you know you know we're not gonna name those libraries yeah but no 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 no, no. <laughs> not throwing anybody under know. the bus but that, that's something that's something that I'll add is that what we try to do is with a project pitching library tracks early on I'll also do that if someone's like hey I need a music for this thing I'm looking to license something I'll say cool tell me about it and I'll send them a playlist of tracks and so my rates for licensing are less expensive than the premium houses and a little more expensive than the ones that we won't name. Yeah. <laughs> um, but also, you know, it saves a lot of digging through just garbage. <laughs> and I can I can call it garbage because I've made plenty of that garbage too. So. <laughs> yeah, I, well, I think it's just the fact that you're kind of, you know, you've done a lot of motion design work and stuff. And obviously, like, if you're just going to a random music library it's going to be a whole host of things whereas I feel like your library is more catered to our kind of industry in a way from what I've seen you know yeah it's true I definitely have like corners of my library that are like these are the motion graphics -y kind of tracks yeah exactly so then it makes it much much easier <laughs> than if you're like traipsing through like libraries that 
they're kind of not as focused, I guess. So with Marmoset and you doing stuff for them, do you like hold the license as well so you can put it in your own library or, or do you just do stuff for them particularly, if that makes sense? Yeah, so with them, it's um, they're basically like a, an agency representing my music. Oh, okay. Um, so I own all the music still. And then we have an agreement that says they can, basically they can go out and sell it. There's definitely libraries that have exclusive licenses, but, you know, I mean, I don't really touch that because at this point it's like, well, I have enough of a business now that I want to keep building my business and I want my work to be my work. And so I love that kind of arrangement where they can help me find placements for things. And it's hilarious getting back like like where stuff gets gets placed without actually interfacing with the client at all. <laughs> Oh yeah, a buddy and I did a project. We had a song that gets played at Katy Perry concerts for her fragrance ads or something. Oh <laughs> and it's really? Like, okay, I guess yeah. <laughs> so it's like That's okay, I guess funny. we got a jumbotron Katy Perry commercial, uh, or like um, we had a track licensed for actually the the mastering software that I use the plugins, and I was like, oh, so you know, excited about that. So it's kind of fun just to sort of have these. You know, connections or whatever that you wouldn't you wouldn't have otherwise just with your own business. Yeah, just kind of going off a bit. If you were like a sound designer starting out, how how do you think you would kind of get started? Do you think it's good to go down the library route, or do you think just kind of talk to individuals would be better? For me, I had a really hard time actually getting into libraries early on. For me, when I was getting started. I was. I said, I'm not going to try to make money making music because that's just going to be way too competitive and I'm not really good enough at it. And then someone early on had told me, he said, you know, if you get really good at engineering and you get good at sound design, people are going to start asking you to make music. And that's that's what happened for me. And so I think if someone is really passionate about the music side, at the very least, making library tracks is super valuable because it's really great practice when you're making essentially client music without a client. And like without the pressures of of a client, yeah, I would say some libraries though really aren't great to their artists. <laughs> I guess is the way of putting it. Of yeah, like they don't yeah. pay that well, and they expect like exclusivity, or they expect a lot from their clients. So I've had some really bad experiences with music houses, but like I said, I, I really love Marmoset a lot. I feel really lucky to have gotten in there, but it took me a really long time before they would rep my work, but. I think it goes back to sort of exploring the opportunities that it present themselves. And the nice thing with library stuff is at the very least, you can always make music for your own library. Yeah. And at the very least, that's building your portfolio or it's honing your skills. And hopefully you can, you know, get licenses from from those tracks later on and they'll pay themselves back financially. Yeah, so you probably would say maybe it'd be good to do like sound design and then kind of build up your own library of music. And I should distinguish real quick the difference between a sound designer and a composer. Yeah, yeah, that would be good. So technically, these are really, they're different disciplines. But I think in motion graphics, it works really well for someone to do music and do sound design. Um, because so much of the time, you're able to integrate the two uh, more closely. So you can use sound effects that are tonal and fit in with the music and the aesthetic of the music. And you can make music that makes room for sound design and like sort of as a platform for sound effects and sound design. Yeah, so do you think you're kind of more rare in the fact that you do both? You think most people would either be a composer or a sound designer? I I think in sort of the, the motion graphics area, I think a lot of people do both. That's for a few reasons. I think part of it's because you can get such good crossover and like mesh the two. Yeah. Um, and that's definitely something our company is passionate about is being holistic with our soundtrack and like letting music influence sound design and sound design influence music. I think also the music tends to be simple enough that you can do both. So like a lot of more explainer kind of stuff, like the music needs to be simple so that it yeah. supports the message. And it's more about just sort of the vibe and the feel of it. And really like the just like the aesthetic of the music, which isn't that different than designing a sound design aesthetic for something. Um, but you know, if you look at like AAA video games or like film, the disciplines are so much different composing for a, like an orchestra compared to creating sound effects for a spaceship or something. 
Yeah, yeah, that's true. That's like, I guess I just like, I'm thinking of it from a motion design perspective. So it makes it easier if you're going to go to somebody who has sort of both of those skills, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. But yeah, obviously you have like the big film composers and, you know, people who do loads of Foley and things like that as well. Yeah, exactly. Where I think those are like more different of disciplines than with a lot of the stuff I work on with motion designers. Yeah, do you think that's why you kind of like it? Because you can kind of cross do both jobs, if that makes sense. So you can kind of bring it all together a bit more. You have more ownership over it. Yeah, definitely. And I think ultimately, I really like the idea of sound effects that sound like music and music that sounds kind of like sound effects. Yeah. (laughs) I just think there's something really fun about that. So I did, for one example, um, I did a short film called Split. And... When I got it, it was like already done. It was basically like, it's, it's really abstract, but there was like a very clear like rhythm and tempo to it. But the animator didn't edit to an actual musical tempo. Right, yeah. And so I was like, oh gosh, how in the world am I supposed to make music for this thing that like clearly it's dictating a tempo, but it wasn't done to a musical tempo. I was like, well, maybe I'll just like go with the tempo that he laid out. And so I started, I just like moved a kick drum to match this piece of the animation and moved a snare drum to match this. And it was this cool kind of like wonky beat that came out of that that was literally just taking what the animator had done and that sense of pacing and putting musical notes to it. And then from there, kind of refining it and whatnot. And so, you know, I use that example to say that I think that animators are inherently really musical in the sense that like the same kind of pacing that feels good to watch an animation is the same kind of pacing that feels good to listen to. And so I love the idea that I can draw inspiration from what the animation is doing and create music and create sound effects from that. And I can draw inspiration from these sound effects that I made to go with the animation and make music that better supports that. But what it really comes down to maybe is like this like kind of multidiscipline or like multimedia type art is really interesting to me. Because it's it's creative on like several dimensions, I guess. And I feel like it's collaborative um, across fields and and that kind of thing. Yeah, I think what you were saying reminded me, I can't remember where I heard it or who said it, but I think someone said they make their team listen to like the same kind of soundtracks or like the same music whilst they're animating to kind of set the pace of the animation. But I was like, oh, that's so clever. Like such a great idea to kind of bring the team together or like even I was thinking like oh when I'm making an animation that maybe it's more like spooky or something I don't know that's the first thing that came into my head and then maybe you would be listening to more like horror soundtracks or do you know what I mean to kind of get that feeling in your head kind of out into the the world that you're creating that makes complete sense to me and I just that blew my mind Oh, absolutely. I mean, it's it's really interesting to me the way that like visual aesthetics inspire different sound aesthetics and vice versa. I actually, I've got a, kind of my next sort of side project I want to do is make a bunch of kind of moody cyberpunk music, like science fiction, futuristic stuff. And I really want to create a lot of time to just like immerse myself in in more of that kind of stuff, like make sure like read a lot and read comics and watch movies that are all in that genre to sort of just like get in the mindset of that. Because yeah, I think it really it really can like inspire a lot. Yeah, I guess it's the thing of like, you get inspiration from everywhere. So this is not normally a podcast about inspiration, but it's just so funny how everything kind of links together and like different pieces of art influence motion design and then music influences motion design and motion design influences music and uh, like, you know, you could go on forever, but I just think it's fascinating. That's, I think, why I really like doing what I do is I really would not like to be a music artist. Like the idea of making albums for people that, you know, they just listen to the, to my music and it stands on its own is really daunting. But the idea of like, Oh, well, you know, I can I can bring something to the table on this animation that's already like a cool, interesting story, or has like an idea to it, or an, a feeling to it that's worthwhile. To me, that that feels really like encouraging and inspiring. Yeah, definitely, I'd agree with that. 
I think it's like, like you say, it's like a collaboration in itself. And that's what we're like, I'm always talking about on this podcast, I feel is like, everyone's always like, yeah, collaboration, (laughs) you know, that's the most important thing, being involved in the community, you know, and like, again, talking to you, that's definitely seems to be the big thing about, you know, kind of being successful in a way, I guess, is kind of being involved in the community and just trying to collaborate with people. And yeah, I mean, it's been, it's, I don't think I'd be doing what I'm doing now if I, if it wasn't for that. Basically, I got to, I, I was at this point where I realized like I had to freelance or else there's nobody who would hire me. And then I was like, shoot, well, how do I freelance? And it's like, well, I was already making friends with people and then they were hiring me for jobs. So like, I'll just keep making friends with people, <laughs> you know, yeah. like that's like what I, that's fun, you know, it, it feels good. And then, but it actually like supports a career. Yeah, it's true. It's so true. It's really interesting. So everyone just has to go out and make loads of friends in the animation community yeah. or the sound design community <laughs> and then it'll be fine. <laughs> it's a little bit more complicated than that, I think. But it's like, that's the, when you break it down, I think it really, really helps a lot of people. And that's how, you know, because it's all built on recommendations and things like that. So if you're kind of a nice, friendly, cool person who does a good job, then that's going to, people are going to say that when they go, oh, who should we get to do sound design? They'll be like, let's get Wes, obviously, because he's a cool guy and he does a good job, you know? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's important. I, I couldn't imagine if I had to go like get business, like how typical salespeople do for, you know, selling, I don't know, like cleaning supplies or or whatever. Yeah. Like the idea of having to like schmooze people and try to convince them to hire me sounds awful, but I love you know, just going out to a, a conference or chatting with people on Twitter or, or whatever it is. Like, that's just fun. I think that sense of authenticity, though, is really important because like, I don't know, maybe that's why the, the community is the way that it is because everybody who is part of the community is there because they're like authentic and, and want to be like, if people are really fake and really just like sales-ish, <laughs> I, I don't feel like it's going to like be satisfying for the individual. And I don't think that's going to be like received well by by other people. Yeah, of course. I think everyone gets involved because they kind of just want to be chatting to other people about this stuff and then maybe getting jobs from other animators or whatever becomes like a byproduct of that. Yeah, and it's always it's always cool. To, like whenever you do something that's niche, it's always cool to meet other people who like get it. Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, it's always the joke of like, how do you explain your job to your parents or whatever? <laughs> yeah, or your, or your kids. I, I tell people what I do out here in in Michigan, and they're like, "What? That's a that's a job?" <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's so funny. Yeah. Well, I just wanted to thank you for licensing the music for the podcast, and with is it Dan Koch? Is that how you say his name? Oh, uh, Dan Coke. Oh, Dan Coke. I was saying it totally wrong. I'm sorry, everybody. I'm sorry, Dan. Oh, that's fine. I should have I should have called that out early. <laughs> On the it's podcast, definitely not then. the first time it's happened to him. Well, uh, yeah, we'll put all the links in the show notes anyway, so then everyone can find all the music and everything easily, and you don't have to rely on me saying it. Cool. So, yeah, thanks so much for coming on the show. It was so great. Yeah, thanks for having me. Thanks so much again to Wes for coming on the podcast. I just want to thank him again and Dan Coke for licensing the music to this podcast. And also wanted to thank my podcast editor, Jeremy Enns. I haven't mentioned him before, but if he wasn't helping me edit this podcast, then it wouldn't be in existence. So I really, really appreciate that. Now, if you'd like to support the podcast, you can do that in a number of ways. One of those ways is you can go over to patreon.com forward slash motion hatch. You can support us financially there. And then you also get some rewards like you can ask podcast guest questions and we do some live Q and A's and there's a little community over there too. You can also leave us a rating review on iTunes. That just really helps get the podcast out there. And we really appreciate that. Thanks so much for listening to the show. Take care.